Good evening, Shady Grove family. Pastor Stephen here. It is Wednesday night, and I hope that each of you all have sat down and are ready to be blessed by the word tonight. And uh, we have a special guest tonight, which I am uh, really excited about hearing because I've heard him teach Sunday school, and I've heard him encourage me daily, but I've never heard him preach. So I am really excited to hear him preach today, uh, tonight. And uh, that's Mr. John Fields. But uh, before we get started, I want to give you a few announcements. Remember that Homecoming Memorial Day service is this Sunday. Uh, we'll have all the bells and whistles. We'll have our FM tune in. We'll have our Facebook Live. We'll have, you know, all that stuff going on. So come on out. There's no reason not to. Uh, I know it's supposed to be warm, but you can leave the air conditioner on and still hear us on the radio. Uh, you can hear us on Facebook Live in your car or anywhere. You know, you can just drive up and enjoy the service, enjoy the singing, and uh, enjoy seeing everybody inside your car and so on and so forth. Uh, as much as we'd like to say we're having dinner on the grounds, that's not going to be possible at this time. But uh, I was given a really great idea that if maybe all of you want to do a, a covered dish, bring it by the preacher's house, drop it off. I will Facebook Live myself eating it. And y'all can kind of enjoy it that way. Not sure if that, I'm just kidding. I, I hope you all know that uh, we really miss the fellowship part, but we are anxiously awaiting uh, getting back to that. But uh, without further ado, I want to open us up in prayer. And uh, then I'm going to let uh, Brother John break the bread for us tonight. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much, Lord, for just your loving kindness for who you are. Uh, Lord, I pray that you just be with be with the folks that are tuning in, Lord. I pray that you just bless them and keep them. Lord, I know there's still a lot of anxiety and a lot of angst that's going on in the world, Lord. Help us to rely on the only true hope that we have, and that's in Jesus, Lord. God, I pray that uh, you just uh, bless John. I pray you just uh, open up the open up the gates and just fill him up to overflowing so that uh, he'll be able to... Uh, uh, preach your word and do it in a, in a manner that is honor and glorifying to you. Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord. We love you, and we ask all these things in your precious, precious holy name. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Welcome, Brother John Fields, up here, and uh, we'll be excited to hear. Well, good evening, folks. Uh, so good to be here with you this evening. Uh, it's a little different with a, a sermon versus teaching Sunday school. Um, the Lord laid something on my heart the other day, and I want to share it with you. It's a simple question. Why doesn't God want to be your disciple? Now, that may seem kind of odd, because uh, you want to be his disciple. But lots of folks want God to be their disciple. And I'll, I'll go into explaining that. We read The Purpose Driven Life probably a dozen years ago, and the very first thing you learn in that is, it's not about you, it's about God. And that's... Oh my God. No, I'm just teasing. That's not all I have. Um, but it's true, and, and it does tell you what I want to talk about. Um, have you ever made a request of someone that gets turned down, or that never gets answered, you think? Or have you asked for something, but they don't exactly give you what you asked for? Uh, now, Friday will make 30 wonderful years since my wife and I were married, and I don't have a clue what I would do without her, nor where I would be if I hadn't spent all those years with her, and yet my wife and I have a relationship, a relationship where we aren't mutually available ATMs that just spits out everything each other asks for. Um, we wonder about uh, what occasions we can do things for each other, and we discuss it, uh, but it's not always that way. So even if your spouse or some, anyone else who truly loves you would do anything for you, there are some common reasons why you don't get what you ask for from them. It can't be done. You can't be who you are and do the things you're asked to do. It can be done, but it's not right. You can't do be the person that you are and expect uh, to continue to do these things. Um, you can't be who you are because it's wrong to do it. Um, and God can't either. God can't do it? Yes, there's things that God can't do. Um, teenagers always ask, can God build a rock that's too big for him to pick up? Somebody always asks that, sooner or later. Uh, and here's the answer. Uh, it's found in uh, Job 38.4. It says, where were you 
when I founded the earth? Declare if you know understanding. Who has set its dimensions for you? Do you know? Or who has stretched a line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who cast its cornerstones? So now, Randy would understand this better than I, but when you go to build a house, you go to build a building. I've worked on many, but uh, never been the chief architect. But God was the chief architect of the earth. So he built the biggest rock you can think of, and he built them all over the place. And uh, he does the joke, you know, where were you at when this happened or that happened? Because he did it, and he did it exactly right. So the answer to that is that it's not a serious question that a lot of people ponder, but every teenager one time or another have asked that. Now, our relationship with him uh, is first accepting Jesus. So how, how are we to go through life and depend on him and have a relationship and expect him to give us things if we don't first accept Jesus? The answer is we can't. The second is uh, to be dependent on how we feel at the time, but it's also uh, in prayer. If you have a relationship with someone and you don't spend any time with them, how are they gonna be your disciple? How will they know to walk the way you walk. Uh, there's that old story that Charles Lee used to tell about uh, the young fellow that wrote a letter to his sweetheart, said he would cross the highest mountain, swim the deepest ocean, walk across the widest desert to get to her any time. And if it didn't rain next Thursday, he would be over to see her. So sometimes our situations are not what we say we are. And, but it's also in our walk. It's also in our expectations for our life. Now, it's not wrong to want, but it's wrong to want and expect God to do what he cannot and still be God. And usually just a portion of scripture is what I use from one verse to another, but I'll jump around a little bit to answer a few questions. Now, here's how we ask things and we get told no by God, because he wouldn't be God if he answered these when we asked. First of all, we ask with the wrong motive. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. His grace, his mercy, his wisdom, anything else uh, will be understood according to his will. It's not the Cadillac. It's not the preacher's new truck. It's not the preacher's new bass boat. It's what's according to God's will and the things he has to offer. And maybe there aren't things that you hold in your hand. But there are the things that make the difference and answers our questions. And according to his purposes, one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So all these things that come into our life, whether we expect them, whether we want them, whether we dislike them, whether we hated them, they're for the good of the people who love him. And it's for you as well as you love him, that you would grow in him. And you would come to expect that his leading is the way to go, no matter what your desires are. And finally, on this question, we ask with the wrong motive. It's James 4, 3 is my verse. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Uh, there's a lot of fishermen in this church, and we all love to go fishing. Uh, and we, we hopefully one day will get to ride on some of those boats to go fishing. But uh, if we do that, and we spend all our time and money on the lake and away from God, we are spending our passions wrongly and asking for those things to allow us to be away from God, no matter whether it's fishing or anything else, is for the wrong motive. Number two of these three questions is, we ask something outside of God's plan. We ask that someone doesn't die. We ask for that job, that spouse, money. You know, when I was young, I grew up wanting to be in the military, like the whole rest of my family. I wanted to be a pilot. When I became six foot five in the eighth grade, that was out of the picture because you could only be six three. When I also started wearing glasses because I had no depth perception, that killed being a navigator or anything else. But because God had a plan for me, I am here this evening with my family and with you, my church family. And I thank God that it didn't work out. Because, you know, I had this plan and, and I thought I'd found the one to spend my life with. Well, that wasn't the one. And I also thought that if I asked God when my son was born with a serious heart condition, if he would take me 
and help him to live, that was the right thing to do. And it wasn't. It was the wrong thing to do. I asked something out of God's plan. Now, God used that thing because the change, yes, my son was healed. But the change came in me, not so much in my son. It was a bigger miracle in me from where I was headed to where I am today. And I praise God for that change. Now, Jesus said in John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 14 says, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And Psalm 139, 17 says, How precious also are thy thoughts and the me, O God, how great are the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand, and when I wake, I am still with thee. Lots of folks in this world today think they can name something that God will give them, and they claim it and become theirs. How sad that is when someone is suffering affliction, when someone has turned a downturn in their life, their finances, their health, their family, and they pray to God, I'm naming and claiming this thing in your name, and you're going to give it to me. If it's within the Lord's will, he will give it to you. But if it's outside of that, he will bring you through that thing. He will help you out of it. He will give you a chance to show others who you are because you're his child. He will help you to reach people because you've been through this and they have it and they see that you made it. It's all in about how we walk with him, not what he gives us physically or that we can stick in our hand. Amen. Now, the last question is this. We ask something that is contrary to his character. Can God make that big old rock I was talking about? Will God be different the next time he sees me? Will God abandon me? Will God ever lie to me? To all those questions, I answer just this, but God. Because God is there, he is there always. And I'm going to add some uh, scripture here to show you these things. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. There is nothing dark about God. There is nothing different about each time that he does something for you. Each way he reacts to it is all in fairness. It is always the best thing. You know, you buy something that is made of glass, and maybe maybe you bought your sweetie a diamond ring at some point and it had a crack in it, or the stone fell out. That's embarrassing. God never has a shadow of turning. He's always perfect. I used to love to turn metal on a lathe, and yet uh, there were times when it wouldn't be level and it wouldn't turn right, or you couldn't get it to come out right no matter how much work you did. And at some point, you'd taken so much off that you couldn't make it any better and you had to start over again. God can take whatever he is to turn on that lathe, and you can know that he will do it the best that it can ever be done, and it will turn out to perfection every time because there is no error in what he does. Numbers 22, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received a commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Nor can God. God is never going to lie to you, and if he blesses you with something, he's not going to reverse it because you are something less than you thought you should be. You will always be something less than what God thought you should be. But God loved you enough to send the very best. It's not a Hallmark card, it's his son. God loved you enough that no matter what came, what you did, if you asked for forgiveness, he would give it to you. He would grant it to you. He would treat you the same as the person who stood and preached for 50 years as the person who come drunk in the back door and was saved. He loves you both equally. I love that saying, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I'm going to take you someplace where a fella was sent to do something. And uh, we worry about why he did it. Uh, we worry about what he said. But God was all in this. And I'm just going to go through it fairly quickly. You know, I talked about, will God abandon me? The Bible says he'll neither abandon you nor forsake you. And that's true here. And it says he won't lie. And he says he won't be different. He says he'll do what he says he would. Let's look very quickly. 
first at the fourth chapter of Jonah. And I'm going to go through this quickly for you, and then I'm going to surmise it at the end. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in thy country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better to me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and set to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in a shade till he would see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant that made it come up over Jonah, that it might shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up from the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And as he might die, and he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being, in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there were more than 120,000 people who do not know the right hand from their left, and also much cattle. I never understood the much cattle, but that don't really matter. Now God foretold that this city would be overthrown. And he sent Jonah out because it was his wish that he would go and tell the people that they were going to be overthrown in a certain amount of days. And Jonah ran the other way because he didn't like these people, because these people were horrible to his people. But God made a great fish, as you know, and he took him to the city and spit him out. And he sent him in, and I think about Jonah being inside the belly of that fish and probably being bleached white, and he was a sight. And maybe that's part of why the people listened to him. But the other part was because God had sent him with a message, and God is sending you with a message. God is putting things in your heart that you need to do. God has this time set apart. It's a different time from any other time we've ever known, and yet we have this opportunity to love people, to reach people, to know people, to repair relationships, to repair our relationship with God, not to make him our disciple, to make us a better disciple for him. Now, so he's sitting there and he, he went up to the one side of the city on a hill because that's the direction the waves could come in. And he made this little booth and he sat there and he was waiting to watch the destruction, even though he delivered the mission and he had told them what they had to do to be saved and they were saved and they were different. Uh, they were saved spiritually. They wouldn't come to be saved physically. Now, this doesn't say this in the book of Jonah, but this is going to show that God always does what he says he will do. You can count on him. And if he says something's going to happen, you can be assured that later someone somewhere will say, and it came to pass. So he sat there and watched it, and he was so proud because God made this huge plant come up and Shaded from this hot heat with the hard, dusty wind blowing in his face. And then God made a little tiny worm to come up overnight for this plant that Jonah was so proud of. For Jonah didn't see all the mighty workings around him that God is doing. God is doing mighty workings around us all day long, every day since this thing started. People have become complacent. People who haven't looked to God in a long time. People that I remember from high school that probably never darkened the church door. People that we forgot about and we shouldn't. People are coming back to God and I just pray that they continue and they stay on the journey and they become his disciple to walk with him daily. So, God had told the devil to be overthrown and he sent that worm and it killed the plant. There are things in our life that we just have to do. We have to get home in time to watch this thing on TV or we'll just die. We have to play this thing on your tablet or your computer or we'll just die. We have to clean this thing in the house or you'll just die. We have to go buy this thing before they run out of toilet paper or you'll just die. But the truth of it is, is without Jesus, you are just dying. And if you can't spend one tenth of what you're doing on all these things I just named for a time with Jesus during the day, then you're just dying. And you don't really 
have the relationship with him, even if you're saved. What a difference your life would be. How much could you have a better life? How much could they say when you are passed away, there's that guy that won on Candy Crush on level 5,000? Or could they say, there's the guy that led me to cross? Which is better? Can we consider that? Can we be honest with ourselves? But God, let's jump over to Nahum, and I'll really finish this time. Nahum 3 7 says, And it came to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? God is always God. He's always good. He's always graceful, merciful. And he always loves his people and does what he says. And in this, even though the people were saved, he said the city would be overthrown, and they were. Some people finish the book of Jonah at the end of the book of Jonah, but that's not where it ends. We can read on in the Old Testament, some of the minor prophets, and see where he was continually faithful. And he is continually faithful in your life today. He is continually faith faithful to keep all of his promises. He desires a relationship with you. He desires you to be his disciples because it really is all about God and not about you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for this country to turn around. I, I can't see it tomorrow without a great revival. And I pray it starts with me. If we would all just to draw a circle around our feet and start a revival, dear Lord, how much we can change this land. If we'd all want to draw closer to you, how much we can change this land. If we would work to change ourselves to be more like you rather than working to change you to be like us, how much better this world could be. Lord, I, I thank you folks and I thank the Lord and everyone for being with us this evening. And until we're together again, I'm praying for you and I love you.